So, I mean, um, today I would like to take you to a tour about the approach we have in our research group, which I called mesoscopic or particle-based modeling and discrete simulation. So I, I will not talk so much about thrombolysis because basically you have heard me many times about that. I just have a few slides at the end to show you maybe the, the latest result that could be of interest uh, to you. Uh, so the, the topic is basically, I wanna also share some thought about what is modeling and also convey this idea that sometimes you don't need something complicated uh, many times interesting phenomena, they don't result from something complicated, they just result from uh, a collection or the interaction of many simple elements. I'd like also to um, mention that space and time are really critical in many processes and, and you cannot forget about uh, things that's uh, develop in space and in time. Uh, just take a snapshot of something is usually not enough to understand how things go. Um, I'll discuss what I mean by, by uh, uh, micro and macro level, but also in between we have this mesoscopic modeling, which I guess is not so clear for many of you what they are. And more precisely what I have in, in, in mind is this discrete model like cellular automata and lattice Boltzmann method. So we'll spend some time on cellular automata because I think it's fun and it's, it's a, a a way to think of modeling, which I think is uh, is interesting. And after that, depending on the time I have, I will go through some biomedical application, which is a uh, thrombus formation in cerebral aneurysm. We did some uh, work on platelet uh, transport and red blood cell interaction. And finally, a few slides about uh, thrombolysis. So let me start with this uh, little slide. So this is a painting by uh, René Magritte. And uh, if you don't read French, this is simply written, this is not an apple. And of course, this is a bit disturbing. The first time I saw that, I say, well, is this uh, painter so doubtful of his talent? For me, it's clearly an apple. So what's the problem? And actually it's clearly not an apple. It's just an image on a, of an apple. So, and if you think of that, this has big consequences because this image is perfect even if you want to show uh, to someone how an apple looks like, fine. But if you want this person to discover the taste of an apple, this image is just useless. So again, you understand clearly that when you represent something, it can only give you part of the real things and that we have to keep that in mind uh, in, in what follows. Also something which I want to uh, insist on is the fact that many problems they become interesting when they are subject to, you know, flow, boundary condition, exchange with the external world. And if you take this bottle of water, I mean, the, the water inside is totally uninteresting in terms of its movement compared to the situation of a wave. You see how rich the dynamic is. And I think, again, it's, it's very important to remember that in nature, everything takes place in space and time. It can evolve over time. It depends on what uh, the boundary conditions are. And something which is at equilibrium in biology is just something dead. So if something is living, it means that you keep exchanging with uh, the external world and you have a flow inside your system. And so when you do modeling, I guess it's good really to remember that you want to understand the phenomena in its space and time component. Okay, also a few words about microscopy and macroscopy. So this is molecule of water. I mean, typically that's a way to represent water molecule uh, together at the scale of the atoms. Okay, and what is interesting is that uh, the same object is also represented by this equation when you are looking at a much lar larger scale. So at the microscopic scale, you see atoms, but at the macroscopic scale, you see a flow, you see a velocity field, you see a pressure. And it means that even though 
uh, this equation represents the movement of those objects, it's very disconnected somehow. So <clears throat> what is a good model then? Okay, and my, my key point, of course, it depends on your question. So there's no model that will answer all possible questions. So we have first to define what is it that we want to address. And of course, as I just say, it depends very much on the scale at which you are asking the question. So if you have a question at the microscopic level, it's not the same description if you uh, are interested it's in some phenomena that are on a large scale. So typically you have to decide, is it microscopic, macroscopic, or something that we will discuss in between. Okay. So another thing that a model should do is, is it should explain something. Uh, we want to use a model to understand better than what we do. It should pred predict and it should also uh, be useful to, to solve new questions beyond what you were trying to solve. And as an illustration, I, I just show you this model from uh, Ptolemy's explaining the movement of the planet when you actually put the Earth in the middle. And this is interesting because this model is actually quite accurate and quite predictable. So it can predict uh, a new eclipse, it can predict many things. But of course, when we see that, we are not satisfied. So there's something that uh, this model doesn't do. And I think it doesn't, it's not able to generalize. So if you take this model to another uh, planetary system, it will probably fail. And of course, uh, if you put the sun in the middle, everything gets much more generalizable. Okay, so all these things that, that you want to have for a model, I think are important. And from my own experience, I realized that um, uh, something which is very good about modeling is that it forces you to ask questions that otherwise you may just, uh, just uh, forget about them. I mean, when you write a model, you try to design a model, you are forced to think of all the system from its uh, start to the end, its development in time and in space. And then you have to ask a lot of questions of how things are connected, how things are linked. So anyway, a model, even if it's not the perfect one, it forces you to ask new questions about the reality. And so it's, it's a very good process of uh, scientific development, I would say. So I like this uh, quote by Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. I think that's definitely what we would like to apply to define a model, try to find this right level, because if it's too simple, it's just wrong. And if you make the model too complicated, just useless. So you have to find this window in which you answer your question and it's still using the proper ingredient uh, that, that you need to explain, predict your processes. So something which actually is, is maybe surprising but turns out to be a key in, in all this uh, approach is to realize that the, the detail of your system may actually not matter so much. Okay, if I wanna rephrase that, I would say that the macroscopic behavior depends very little on the detail of the microscopic interaction. For instance, if you are interested in the flow of air or water or oil, that's the same equation, you know? although the microscopy may be quite different. And actually, when you zoom out from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic level, actually many things get blurred and, and what you only keep, I mean, what, what really survived to the, the zooming out is what we can call conservation law, like conservation of energy, of mass momentum, or some symmetries of the process that will never be forgotten even if you zoom out but a lot of other things, they might just be uh, disappeared. And I, I wanna maybe illustrate this with a, a simple example, which is the diffusion process. I probably, you're more or less familiar with it. So at the microscopic level, uh, diffusion process, it, it describes the fact that statistically particles are uh, moving randomly. So there are some disorders somewhere 
at the scale that you're not really interested in. And as a result, you can uh, see that the particle, they move randomly. That's the famous Brownian motion. But if you go to the macroscopic scale, you probably know this famous diffusion equation, which tells you that the variation in time of the probability or density to find a particle at a given time goes like its second sp spatial derivative with a coefficient here. And it turns out that this diffusion, the, this coefficient known as the diffusion constant, it actually includes all the detail of the microscopic world. So everything which happened at the small scale is just reduced to one single coefficient. And what this equation actually tells you is that mass is conserved. Okay, it's the only thing that it really says. And in addition, a bit something about how mass is moved across space, but I'm, I'm not going to enter too much into detail. But even though you have the same macroscopic behavior, same diffusion equation, you can have very different microscopic interaction giving the same behavior. And for that, I'd like to maybe illustrate that with hopefully this code that you can see hopefully here. So this is just a random work simulated on a computer. So it's, it's uh, actually many particles. I will have thousand particles, each of them making thousand random steps. And you see they all start from the beginning and you see how they explore the space. So they have a way to move microscopically, I would say. And um, this way can be changed. I can modify the probability that you turn up, down, left, and so on. I can change the probability of how much I jump, one voxel, two voxel, or whatever. But whatever you do, you still get uh, in an equation, which is the diffusion equation, which describes this. Okay. And maybe I want also to show you another example. Okay which is a, a different microscopy, also simulated in a computer, where you see a different situation where you put particle on the left compartment and you see them actually move, diffuse in the other compartment. But the, the detail of the movement of this small particle is different from my other example, yet they all are based the same equation. So this gives us, this leads us maybe to this idea of mesoscopic model. And I think I, I like this, the physicist uh, Richard Feynman uh, proposing this, this approach this, this way. Since actually we have so many microscopic worlds that have the same microscopic behavior, why not inventing one that is good, easy for me to simulate on the computer that is fast to simulate easy to deal with. Uh, I mean, that's just another microscopy which has the same microscopic behavior. And if I'm interested in the microscopic behavior, this virtual or fictitious microscopy may do the job as well. So just as an illustration, I show you this image and I'm just asking if you recognize this image usually people do so i hope you do this time so here i just have a process which is a time evolution the growth of, of something and i i guess that you you recognize a snowflake uh, which has been grown artificially in a fully discrete universe so space and time are discrete so actually i have little pixels here and at each time step i add a black pixel or not. So if you look at what a real snowflakes is, you see, well, they are still very different from the one that I just simulated. But still there's something that everybody recognizes, And part of it is this uh, order six symmetry, I think. And this kind of dendritic uh, structure. And, and that's typically what you have to capture in your model. You have to capture this symmetry of order six, which is something very fundamental. And you have to kind of capture the way you aggregate a uh, particle to create this uh, snowflakes. And, and the rule is actually very simple. So you have 
a system, uh, a grid like this, okay? And each of these little cells can be either white or black. So if it's black, it means it's a, it's a nice uh, um, cell, so it turns into it's a, something, uh, something icy. And if it's white, you just assume there is just water um, vapor there. And the question is that a vapor cell can turn into ice if it's a neighbor of only one uh, ice cell. Okay, so you need to be close to something that has already frozen, but only one. If you had two frozen particles near you, basically you dilute your, uh, your vapor to both of them and then you're not, not enough vapor to create a new cell. And as you, you see, we use this hexagonal pattern to, to preserve this order six symmetry. So it's a very simple rule, very simple uh, way of representing the growth of a snowflake. It's not perfect, of course, but it has at least the benefit that uh, usually people recognize that, that it's a simplified model and, and you certainly lose a lot of things, but you also get a few things that maybe you want. So let me go to another cellular automata because what I'm describing here is known as cellular automata. It's a, um, simply a grid in space. Here you have an example of a 2D grid where you have cells, okay, a bit like a checkerboard, and these cells can have different states. In the simpler case, it can be either zero or one, or white or gray. And this is a very famous um, system, which is called the game of life. Not so much to do with life in the sense of um, biological life. So it's just a, a name that we have to take like this. Uh, but it has just an evolution rule. So that's typically, a situation at time t, and that's the evolution of this situation at time t plus one. And how do you do that? But the rule is here. So you can create a gray cell if it's neighbor of three uh, gray cells. So here we call the gray cell the living cells. And you can die or you can turn back to white uh, if you are neighbors of less than two or more than three neighbors. So if you're too isolated, you will die. And you have subpopulated, you die also. So let me take the example of that cell here. So this cell, uh, or maybe this cell, this white cell here, it is surrounded by exactly three cells. Okay, so it will at the next time it will become gray. Okay, but this one, which is actually surrounded by only one cell, it uh, disappears by uh, by isolation. Okay, and you can see the rest of the, the rule applies the same to all these cells. So this object at time t will transform into this one, the time t plus one. And here you see just what you get from a random initial condition. Very quickly, you get you know patterns that are created and move in space. So um, I think uh, we can spend hours discussing all these patterns and how they move. Uh, my goal is more to focus on something which I find interesting, is what we call gliders. Okay, so gliders is just an organization of cells. And from this specific organization, which is this one, if you follow five, four time step, four evolution of this very simple rule, so you give birth if there are three neighbors and you die if you're two or, or more than uh, three neighbors, you see that such a structure after four iteration is the same as itself, but it has moved, it has moved in space. So you see that with this very simple rule, you can create something that has the capability to move in space, okay? So that's very surprising because the rule has nothing to do with movement. And you see that actually uh, spatial organization gives you new functionality that were not present in the individual level. So that's typically what people call complex system because by uh, combining the interaction between a simple object, you get, you get new object with more functionality. And it doesn't stop here. You can con continue in the story and you can actually see all these little gliders that you see. So they're called glider because they move in space, okay? Like a little object. 
But you can also have a, here an organization of the same cells, but different organization, which is a glider gun. So the glider gun means that it just fabricate this um, glider uh, all the time. So it's a more complex organization of cells, as you can see, it takes a bit more object, but it has the property of producing object that can move. So let's just illustrate this. So here you see how this glider, they move. Basically, they will go to infinity. And you see how this object that also evolved to the same very simple rule of the game of life, it, it, it moves in a maybe hard to capture way, but anyway, it keeps producing new gliders. So you see that they keep going away. Okay. So actually the game of life is what people call a universal computer. It means that actually you can do whatever you want by a smart organization of your cells. So you can understand that in a maybe simpler way. Actually you can do, you can reproduce any electronic circuit or any electronic gate. You know that computers are made of uh, logical gate which are produced the end or the or or the not between signal and actually there is an organization of cells in the game of life that can reproduce any electronic circuit so you can build a computer with uh, an organization of this cell of course it may not be so easy but you can do something really surprising and here i want to illustrate that you can produce a clock so this clock is entirely made of pixels, which evolve according to the rule of the game of life. Okay, and you see that there are some here circuit, which circuit or you know structure in space, which are doing something which is hard to understand. But anyway, they produce signals, and these signals they are able to change actually the time. Okay, so. Another example I want to uh, give you with this cellular automata is actually related to the origin, the very origin of this concept, which was invented by John von Neumann and uh, Stanislas Ulam in the 40s. And uh, the reason it was invented is that uh, von Neumann he was looking for a new paradigm to explore question. And, and he had an ambition, an ambitious question is to understand um, how cell self-replicate, how life has the capability to have its own recipe for reproducing. Okay, so the object itself is able to exist, but it also able to know how it is fabricated. And this is completely different from what we have in engineering, because in engineering, an object cannot reproduce itself. If you want to copy a piece of paper, you have to go to the copy machine, okay, which is more complex than the piece of paper. And if you want to copy your copy machine, you have to go to the manufacturer of the copy machine to buy a second one. So you don't have a copy machine which are able, which is able to split in two and make two copy machines. But that's what life does. And so von Neumann was very uh, surprised or intrigued by this. And he wanted to see whether we can uh, understand from, uh, I would say, algorithmic or mechanistic point of view, how this is possible that an object can exist and have its own mechanism to reproduce. And I must say that was before people discovered DNA and, and understood how it works. And actually what, what uh, kind of they, they end up is to discover in advance this mechanism of having a code which is actually copied and expressed. So what I want to show you is not this von Neumann model, which is way too complicated. I want to illustrate a simplified version, which is due to Langton in the 80s, which basically uh, has the same property. It uses a, um, a reading and transformation mechanism. And I hope I can yeah, so this is a cell, and you see how this cell, they divide. Okay, so let's try to go into more detail and see how it works. So that's the typically the original object that will, as time goes on, uh, divide and create two cells. So what you can see 
here is what we could we would call DNA. Okay, that's a, that's a gen genetic uh, code, and what you see in blue in uh, sorry in uh, in red that's the membrane. So you see that you have to isolate your cell from the uh, external system if it has to work. Okay, so I will run this step by step. But what you will see you will see that this DNA will just keep rotating. And when it reaches that arms, that uh, junction, it will be dupli duplified. So you see that you have this one here, but you have the same one here. And as it goes, it's always the same. You see this pattern is the same as this pattern. So this corner is just a duplication of the DNA. And when it goes into these arms, it starts to create something new, which is a copy of itself. So let's try to see step by step. So you see this rotating. You see this copy going up, and as it reaches the extremity, it creates something. It creates structure and material. Okay, and that's the way basically you get to uh, uh, this situation where, after uh, I would say typically 150 iteration, you have the um, the new uh, system. Of course, the, the rule here is a bit more complicated than the game of life, so I'm not gonna. Uh, show show it to you, but it, it's a, a finite number of, of steps that needs to be defined according to what's your state and what's your neighbors. That's the same story. Okay, so um, I just want to show you this this image because I, I I find again amazing that with very very simple rules, with uh, limited states per cells you can create so many nice pictures. So this is just random example of uh, cellular automata that usually are, you know, it's, it's, it's four line of, of, uh, of code to express the rule. And you create a spatial temporal situation or patterns that are very rich. Of course, if I would run the system, it will move in time. So you will see all this pattern animated but you already see here all the, um, the, st the spatial structure that can be produced. And, and mostly it's, it's, it's very simple rules. So you understand with this that complexity may just reflect very simple interaction, but over space and time. Okay, and that's basically one of the messages that uh, I want to give you. You don't have to be complicated to get something which is rich. So now I want to uh, go maybe one step further. Also to remind you that when you do modeling, you have several mathematical tools that you can use to do modeling. And one very common is partial differential equation. And we've seen so far example of that with the presentation from uh, uh, Milano and uh, Galloway, where they use uh, this approach to describe uh, the, the way they, they, they move the, the clot outside of the of the vessel, uh, thrombectomy. And uh, so here, I just present you again this equation, differential equation, which describe a fluid movement. So you have the velocity field, okay? You have the density, you have the pressure, you have the viscosity, and, and you have all these mathematical symbols, which are actually derivative. And I want mostly to insist on the process that, that you have to go from your phenomena to your solution. So first, well, th there was a lot of people, scientists, very smart one, that were able to express or describe this phenomena in terms of this mathematical object, which is this differential equation. And these little arrows, it took several hundreds of years before people understood what is differential calculus, what is a differential equation, and so on and so on. Okay, so this arrow was a big effort in math to do, but now it's done, that's great. Now, I think the problem is that when you have this wonderful uh, object, usually it's very hard to solve. Okay, so you cannot solve it like that, except in, in uh, some specific case where you can find analytical solution. So most of the time, you have to transform this into a discrete form, like it can be a finite volume, finite element, or all kind of techniques. 
which are far from trivial, actually. And then finally, you get to your numerical model where you can get your solution, okay? What I want also to say is that this equation, what it actually says is just that momentum is conserved in the fluid, no more. It just expressed that in the language of a continuous uh, system where <clears throat> things are continuous in space and time. But basically the physics which is hidden there is that momentum is conserved and if there's any change it's due to some force. So now you can have a different vision of that, a different approach. And that's what I call the rule-based model, which goes back to something close to uh, cellular automata, is to try to directly express your phenomena in terms of a numerical model, okay? And if we are talking about fluid, I want to do the following abstraction. I will assume that the space is discrete, as we had in this cellular automata. And now you can have particles that travel along the link of this uh, system that are represented with this little arrow. So big arrow means I have a lot of particles traveling into this direction, small arrows that I have a less amount. So it's basically um, the, the, the density of particle traveling in this direction. And you see that at a given time here, that's maybe time T0, all these particles, they meet at the same position. And of course, it's a collision. And what happened with the collision is that all these particles, they bounce and they will just move away from this collision with a new distribution of particles in each direction, okay? And once they do that, they continue their trip and they reach the neighboring site where very likely they will meet again other particles coming from other direction. And you keep iterating that, okay? So what's you should understand, and maybe it's not completely obvious from this image, but momentum is conserved. I mean, if you do the sum of this uh, vector, these arrows, you have the same value here and here. So it, it, there's no modification of momentum. And if you add the length of all these arrows, you, say, you find the same thing. So this collision process, which is just expressed as a, as a drawing here, we can find a mathematical formulation, it just conserve mass and momentum, which is exactly what you need to describe a fluid. Okay, so now basically this idea is what the lattice Boltzmann method does, is to represent a fluid as uh, a, um, a population of particles traveling in all these possible direction at each lattice point and each time step, and describe how the collision takes place and propagation is just to move to the next nearest neighbor. So we can say this is kind of a mesoscopic rule because it's, it's not like uh, before where you have the velocity field or density or pressure. You have something which is as a smaller scale, but still this is not real particle. So it's just an abstraction of the particle somehow. That's why we call that mesoscopic. So as I said, the key symmetry or the key point which makes that as a good candidate as a microscopic or fictitious microscopic universe is the fact that you have the right conservation laws, okay, as in nature. And I guess you probably find this picture pretty more intuitive than this equation, okay, I hope. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I think something which also may be interesting to think of is that probably it's closer to what nature does. It actually has actual collision of particle and uh, probably nature is not solving this differential equation, okay? So that's the idea to try to get at the mesoscopic level, uh, which is an abstraction of the microscopic uh, reality, but simple, simple enough so that you can uh, work efficiently with it. And actually you can do something which I think is quite impressive. So I'm, I'm gonna just show you some demo of the Palabos software, which is the Lattice Boltzmann solver developed in my team, but mostly by my colleague, Jonas Latt. And of course, what I'm gonna show you is, uh, I would say several level above my little drawing, okay? But the idea is this, okay, that, that's the key idea. And from that, well, I show you some ideas of uh, what we can do. 
So this is just an air droplet uh, moving up towards the water surface and creating all this uh, little droplet that you can create with this type of simulation. Another example is you have a moving pumps which produce all these beautiful patterns uh, in, the, in the image. Okay, maybe you may have fun to see how uh, laundry machine works in the US with the organization of being vertical. And uh, we, we didn't do the simulation where this is horizontal as we do in Europe, but uh, anyway, I think it's interesting to see how a fab piece of fabric is dragged. Here you have an, an example of a simulation of a water wave energy converter. So the, the pressure that the water creates in this little box is, is uh, converted into by a turbine to produce uh, electricity. And that's been uh, also compared to real stuff. That's the study we do uh, on the river which flows through Geneva. There is a dam and that's a simulation of the a draining event where they try to empty this lake to clean it uh, from the sediment. And another example uh, is the injection of, of cement in a broken vertebra. The question is to know exactly how much cement you may uh, insert in, uh, in this uh, very complex uh, object. Okay, so that's an example of what we can do with this lattice ball span. Again, of course, clearly more complex than just my little drawing, but, but that's the idea. Okay, now I'd like maybe to start to discuss some um, um, application of that. So I will turn more into um, something uh, biomedical and see how we have been using this uh, in parallel to what we do in uh, INSYST. So we have been working in this European project Thrombus on uh, thromb thrombosis uh, in cerebral aneurysm. So, you know, uh, aneurysm, I guess most of you know, is this deformation that, that you may have on some brain vessel like, like this one. So the, the main vessel is, is this, but for some reason, sometimes you have this uh, bubble that is created and the, the problem is that it can break and then you also have a, <clears throat> a big uh, risk of, uh, of mortality or uh, being handicapped and so there are several ways to treat that but one solution is to insert this object which is a stent or flow diverter so it's like a, a tube with this mesh and the goal is to force the blood to basically does what it's supposed to do and to reduce the speed in this area. And if the speed is reduced, then you may induce uh, thrombosis. And if you induce thrombosis, you will have clotting and this clotting will be the first point to remodel the, um, the vessel. So in this problem, we are happy to have a clot as opposed to what we uh, have in INSYST where the clot is something which is Preventing, preventing blood flow. So uh, the question is, do we understand what's the condition to create this, uh, this situation or not? So that was the idea to combine clinical data, um, simulate numerical simulation and, and so on. So this is just an example of a simulation of a flow diverter and some Particle can be any type of blood particle you want. For now, that's very simplified one. But you see, during the heartbeat, how they uh, move through the, the flow diverter. Still, there is some exchange with the aneurysm, which is important. Otherwise, I mean, the, the tissue will will just die if there is no exchange between the flow and this. So you you need to have a flow diverter which is porous enough to allow you know exchange with this cavity but that reduce as much as possible the flow. So I think an interesting uh, aspect is maybe this one, that if you have uh, the stent here or you don't have the stent and you measure what we call the wall shear stress, so it means basically the friction of the fluid on the wall, you see that indeed when you have the flow diverter or the stent, you reduce this amount of uh, friction 
and that actually uh, tr will trigger some biological processes, reaction from the endothelial cell. Okay, so again, the system is sensitive to the flow. And that's an interesting uh, result that we got, is that uh, if you take some patient, which are all, you know, this little point, some they had this spontaneous thrombus formation, and other one they didn't uh, thrombosis. And what makes the difference between these two set of patients? If you measure the wall shear stress that they have on their uh, aneurysm, you see that there's a clear line that separates them. So if the wall shear stress is too high, you prevent the mechanism of thrombus formation. And if it's low enough, you make it possible. And, and the threshold looks like for the wall shear rate to be uh, 30 uh, second minus one. That looks like what you should achieve to produce a thrombus formation. And if it's not spontaneous, you have to uh, insert a stent that does this job. Okay. So now we try to model this, this clot formation. So we also did some uh, in vitro experiment to uh, really verify that at low shear, the endothelial cell, they produce tissue factor and this tissue factor, they will be pro-coagulant molecules. So they basically produce thrombi. So in our model, we simply say, if the wall shear stress is low enough, then we produce thrombine from the wall, okay? Now, if there are enough of this uh, procoagulant molecule, you will be able to transform your fibrinogen into fibrin, okay, which is the clot, okay? So that's basically the two things that, that we do in this uh, model. It's, it's as simple as that, I would say. But what, what's interesting is that um, as the clot builds up, you will change the shape of the cavity of the aneurysm, and you will change the geometry of your flow. And if the flow change, then you can change the condition of this reaction. So basically all this reaction is triggered by the flow pattern. That's, that's the idea. But otherwise the model is very simple. It's, it's very similar to this particle-based approach. So if this is the wall or an existing clot, uh, if you have like this fibrinogen <clears throat> transported by blood, which is in a region of low enough shear stress, you just block, freeze them, okay? So they, they get blocked, okay? And if, if you have another cell where you have enough of this particle close enough to a region where low shear and connecting to this, well, you also get clot, okay? But if you're in a region where the flow is high enough, you don't, okay? So again, it, it's an extremely simplified approach of uh, the clotting mechanism. And if you run that on an example, you see that all this black point is formation of clot. Here you see the blood flowing, okay? And here everything is, is actually going rather well, I would say doing exactly what we want. But it's very dangerous flow pattern. Instead of taking a side flow, you take a step flow. Uh, and simulation, you see that it's actually quite good. So for uh, a, a given patient, which has a, we call a, a giant aneurysm, where there's a spontaneous uh, uh, thrombosis that happened, that's what, what uh, the clinical data gives. So all this light blue is the clotted area. And that's what the simulation uh, produces. So, so you see, it, it's very similar also. But actually what, what you also get is you observe many of the phenomena that are known by the clinician is that you have this partial or total thrombosis. Sometimes you may even have this apparent, uh, apparent artery occlusion. And you have what's called the, the threshold in the aspect ratio. So small aneurysm or big aneurysm, they don't react the same way to um, the, the disease and, and we can, exactly explain these type of things 
by the mud. Also, we see that there is what people call the onion uh, skin structure of the cloth. So it, it builds by layers like this. This is, of course, well into our model. Okay, so uh, I want to move to the uh, second topic, which is uh, transport adhesion and aggregation of, of platelet, which is something I've been working with Karin, uh, who is also my subcontractor in INSIST. Uh, we started, I think, a few years ago, and that's something that uh, kept us busy for a long time, I must say. So there is this um, device called Impact R, and the uh, Impact R is an object which uh, is like a cylinder in which uh, we put blood from patient. And then you have the upper disc, which is uh, set in rotation. So you create a shear rate. And then as a result, the platelet, they go down and they start depositing on the lower part and they form all this little aggregate. Um, so people call this mechanism shear induced diffusion of the platelet. So due to the fact that you create this shear rate and you have red blood cells, then the platelet, they start moving. Okay. And what's the interest of this experiment is by analyzing the size of this aggregate of platelet, uh, you may understand how the platelet works, what their property like adhesion and aggregation rate. So I don't know, do you want to make a, a little break or or should I continue? Uh, it's up to, uh, to everybody. So we, shall we take a break of, let's say, five minutes? Is that okay? Yeah. Five minutes is fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Very good. So see you in five minutes.
Okay, so I think we can probably continue. So I will share my screen again. Okay. So the, the question we were interested in is to see whether we can, from this image, from the actual deposition of plate, platelet, guess what are the adhesion and aggregation rate of this platelet, and then know what's the property of this platelet. So that's a sketch of the system where you have here the column corresponding to what is observed, or here you have the deposition surface. And in this column, sub subject to a shear rate, you have red blood cells, you have platelet, which are uh, non-activated and activated platelet, that's actually important. And you also have an ingredient which is interesting, which is the albumin. And I must say that's for me also an interesting example where uh, actually modeling was a key point for the biologists to understand that they, are, they were missing an ingredient. Because when first I was asked whether I can simulate this deposition, of course, I had no clue that I should put albumin in my simulation. And actually, nobody knew that albumin was playing a role in this deposition pattern. But you understand very quickly from the simulation that with the hypothesis that you get from the experiment, there's just no chance to, expl to explain what you see. Actually, the result would be completely full of platelet. And if there's something that prevents the platelet to completely cover this region, it means that there's an, another mechanism. And finally, Karim discovered that actually albumin is also depositing and, and blocking this deposition site. So what else he could do is to measure as a function of time, how many aggregate we have, what's their size. And he did that for all these time intervals. So experimentally, that was quite a lot of work. But then it was enough data to uh, compare to the simulation the model and what's the new the model does the model tried to explain how we fill in this surface so yeah I just illustrate a level of albumin so that the darker mean more albumin and the darker means less change for a platelet to deposit okay normally all the albumin start filling up in a homogeneous way but just for the sake of the picture I just show different type of things so on this black there's no chance that the platelet can deposit now Activated platelet, they can deposit on the white spot or when the albumin is not too dense. So that's what you, sh you see here, okay? And that's what we call adhesion. Adhesion is the deposition of activated platelet. And then non-activated platelet, they can actually deposit close to an activated one. So they make basically grow this cluster by collect by, by depositing next to it okay and that's what we call aggregation so aggregation is this formation of the cluster and addition is the formation of the seed of the cluster and what we also discovered is that we have to take into account a third dimension the fact that these actually platelet they can pile up on each other so that was done in a particle based mathematical model that you can run on a computer and if you do that, you happily see that the deposition you get matches very nicely the one on the simulation, provided that you adjust some coefficient. That's the key point. So this addition or aggregation rate, we have to put some values. And if you put the right value, you reproduce the right result. So I think these two quantities are the most interesting for us. But also one which is very interesting is this diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient, it basically tells you how quick this platelet, they will reach this region. So how much material you have for deposition as a function of time, okay? And here we see that we have to choose this value to get a good match. These two plots, they show you that actually you can also reproduce the size distribution, how many a cluster you have a given size, how many cluster of a given volume, because it also goes in the third dimension. So everything looks very pretty good between the model and the uh, impact our experiment. The thing is that there's a problem. This is a, this diffusion coefficient. Again, it's the flow of platelets to this deposition layer. And this is due 
to this mechanism known as shear induced diffusion, the presence of red blood cells, they are pushing the platelet towards the, the, the wall. And if you read in the literature, there is a formula called the Sidney Cotton formula, which tells you what's the diffusion coefficient. Okay, this is an ugly formula, don't really look at it. But what you should see it depends on the shear rate, okay, how, how quick or how fast this, this uh, cylindric, this, this upper cover of the cylinder rotate, and on the hematocrit, okay, how many red blood cells you have. And if you use this formula, you see that's the diffusion coefficient that you should get is that much. Okay, 10 minus 11. But before I told you that I need 10 minus 8 to match the experiment. So something is really very wrong. So this coefficient is way too small compared to what we use. And actually, if you want to see that in a different way, you can see how many platelets would reach this deposition layer in 20 seconds. If you assume this diffusion by Sidney Cotton, you only get 150. Okay. But actually in the experiment, you, you see 3000. Okay. And to get this 3000, you, you need to have a much faster uh, diffusion coefficient. So there's a mismatch of three order of magnitude basically between these two value. And that's like very surprising. So how can we understand that? Well, we had this uh, hypothesis, which I will uh, show you now and, and tell you how we managed to prove it. The idea is actually the platelet, they don't diffuse in a normal way. They don't follow this Brownian motion or random walk as I illustrated previously, okay? I re remember that before you were just, particle was r randomly jumping around its initial position by a given amount. But actually what happened is that the probability of the jump is not a Gaussian distribution, it's a power law, okay? And the result is actually very important because if you use a standard random walk, like a Gaussian or Brownian motion, you see the trajectory of a particle can be this, this blue line. But if you use this type of distribution, so it means that each time you have to move, you pick a velocity in this power law distribution, you get that on some region, you basically follow the same local movement, but suddenly you make a big, big jump and you start again there. So this capability of having a rare event of large amplitude is something that explains very well what we observe actually in the simulation. Okay, but of course this is a bit annoying because it means that this equation is no longer correct to describe the movement of platelet in the uh, system. But anyway, so how did we try to prove this? It was actually difficult because it's something that is not in the literature and goes against what is in the literature. So we decided basically to produce this simulation of deformable red blood cells, okay, in, uh, in suspension in a fluid. So that's an example of this uh, system. And I can show you a few more pictures where you see the platelet as this uh, yellowish system. So this is exactly what we have in this impact. Uh, you have a shear rate. And because of the shear rate, you see the platelet that moves towards the wall. And actually what was also interesting for us, and I'm not going to give too much detail, is to see the impact of the transport of platelet when the red blood cells are actually not healthy. They are deformed by some disease. And here you see that actually it affects the way platelet are transported. But anyway, from this uh, fully resolved simulation, we could actually see what's the movement of the platelet towards the wall. And something we did that actually apparently nobody tried before is to study the way platelet move by increasing the size of the system. So you see what happened in small system, twice the size, three times the size and so on. And you get all these sizes, 50 microns, 100 micron, 250 micron, 500 micron. You should know that the impact R is almost, it's about 800 micron. It's, it should be somewhere here, okay? And then you 
measure something which is called the mean square displacement. It's basically how far are you from your initial point as a function of time. And if you are a standard diffusion, it should go proportional to the time. Okay. But here you see that as the system size increases, you keep increasing. So it means that this object doesn't exist, it diverges. And that's a sign that it's not a standard diffusion. It's typically the signature of a Levy flight or this power law distribution. Okay. And if you use this hypothesis and you change the movement of this platelet with such a process, you explain very well the amount of platelet that you see. In this. So it's, it's a second way to see the consistency of the result. Okay, so now back to the original question, which was how do you get these parameters? And can you determine when you have a patient with some disease, whether these values are modified and uh, if there's any um, sign of dysfunctioning platelet. So this is a, a work that we did in collaboration with uh, uh, Rito Duta, who is now in uh, Warwick University and is an expert in what we call approximate Bayesian computation. So basically it's a way to infer parameter from an observation. So we have this observation. We have a numerical model that explain it. The question is what value should I put to get this? to reproduce these two things. And we use this Bayesian um, formula, which uh, is the following. So that's called the posterior, the probability to have the parameter this much, knowing the observation, knowing that. I can compute that with the probability of having the observation knowing the parameter, which is the simulation, okay? Time uh, distribution of the parameters divided by this. So that's something that you can do in an automatic way. And you get uh, the distribution of all these parameters, which is this aggregation, adhesion, and all other um, parameters that, that we don't really care about now. So what he gets with this is the distribution of error or the most likely value. So here, when you see the adhesion rate, you see the most likely value, but you see also a distribution, which is typically a way to have some quantification of the uncertainty, okay? So from the data, you can say that it's very likely, the most likely value for this addition rate is that much, but there's a probability distribution, okay? And of course, you can do this for all pairs of uh, parameters. You, you have the cross correlation between all these uh, parameters. So this is done for uh, actually a patient with some disease, and this disease is, is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And of course, this, this pattern is different from a LC situation. So let me show some parameters that are important, adhesion uh, of the platelet, aggregation of the platelet, and that's something which describes the motion of the, the platelet, so the diffusion motion, it's a coefficient that describes that. And if we compare the healthy value or two type of disease patient, you can see effectively, indeed that this system is able to determine what is dysfunctioning in the platelet of the patient. So what's the quantity which is away from what it should be for an healthy situation. And of course, platelet that fails to adhere or aggregate, that may completely change some physiological process. So this is a little uh, table where you can see between a healthy and a dialysis patient or co PD patient, what are the parameters that are actually uh, changed? Okay, so I, mean, I don't think it's uh, important to go into the detail, but you can see actually uh, clearly what are the dysfunction you can get from this test. And again, what it requires, it requires the impact air to do an experiment of platelet deposition. It requires a mathematical model to simulate this process and this inference to determine what are the most likely value of the parameter of the simulation to explain what we get. Okay. So finally, I will finish with a few slides. 
I want to go back to the insist topic of thrombolysis. And maybe now you see a little bit better uh, the justification of our approach. So you've seen these slides many times. So really you have the clot and here you see that we can really have all this spatial structure of the clot with different composition. And you have this blood particle, typically TPA or uh, any particle that will start dissolve the, the clot. And here you have this image from a uh, <clears throat> Leuven, Simon de Meyer, which shows that indeed this object is not uniform. You have region of uh, platelet rich, uh, red blood cell rich. And you also have this image which shows that the flow is likely to be non uniform across this, this object. So, again, here we want a simple model, but we want to put this simple model in a realistic flow situation. Okay, so I remember, I remind you what was some of the key ideas. So we have a lattice Boltzmann model for the fluid flow. So I'm not gonna describe that anymore, but I just want to add uh, the problem of permeability. So the fact that the clot is an obstacle for the fluid. And so if you have a, one of these fluid particle arriving on a voxel with, with clots, what happened is that part of the flow goes through and part of the flow is bounced back, okay? And by ad adjusting the fraction of what goes through and what doesn't go, you can define what's the permeability of your system, okay? And in addition, when you have the flow that comes to the clot uh, transporting some drugs, some TPA, well, you can start dissolving that clot, and so you get a lighter voxel with less, um, less fibrin or less clot, okay? So that's basically what the model does. And okay, I just show you again this image that uh, you've seen probably several times, where you see this TPA particle, you see the density of the clot as the red level, and you see the blue line, which indicates the velocity across the system. In that image, you see how the pressure is completely changing as the clot get dissolved until we reach that situation. Okay, so okay, so what's actually uh, new is is this recent experiment we did of thrombolysis with flow because that's that's a key problem how to validate what we just did. So Karim, he did the following experiment as a function of time. So here I just show you three uh, snapshots. He has several test tubes with, here you see the clot, okay, which is a fibrin-rich clot uh, with different um, amount of uh, fibrinogen. So some clots are easier to lease, some are less uh, easy to lease. So there are actually three concentration uh, that we follow here. And on top, we put a solution of a liquid with TPA, and we see how the clot is leased. So you, you can see that after a given time, these two test tubes that are low fibrinogen content, they almost uh, disappeared. But this one, which is a much higher fibrinogen, they uh, survive, they, they are much more difficult to lease, okay? But what we observed, which was, I think, uh, <clears throat> what actually is our surrogate model for now that, that uh, is used by work package six is to see that actually the position of the front that you see here that move down as the time goes on, it just goes as a parabola. That, that's what we get from the observation, detailed observation of all these images. And this coefficient A is a function of the pressure gradient, the pressure difference between the two parts, the concentration of fibrinogen that we use to create the clot and its permeability, okay? So we still, of course, have to work a little bit on these parameters and, and to integrate that in uh, the model that we've seen here. So this is ongoing work. And finally, I wanna show you also some recent data. So we had a bachelor student, Antoine Bachmann, who actually took uh, many images from uh, uh, Simon de Meyer's team which were pictures of uh, um, 
clot extracted from thrombectomy. So it was all these slices that you can see that were uh, actually given as a picture. And the challenge was to align them and to rebuild the third uh, subject in three dimensions. So that's what you get here. So this is the first reconstruction of a clot uh, obtained from uh, histology. And here, uh, just for the illustration, we take this clot, so actually we just cut it so it just match the size of um, a nice cylinder, so that's what you see here. And we started to turn on the lysis process, so you see as a function of time how lysis goes on. And um, so what it means, which is not so clear on this image, is that the concentration or the composition of each of these slices changes. So it means that here you see that as an homogeneous uh, media, but it's not. It's a, it's a, a composition of red blood cells or platelet-rich. And for now, we don't have a real uh, calibrated rule to know what's the permeability or the speed of the lease for such uh, system, but at least we can have something which is space dependent. So with this, I'd like to uh, finish and to thanks, of course, Karim for uh, a collaboration which lasted for many years now, uh, Rito for this machine learning and parameter inference. I want also to thanks for uh, computing resources on the uh, supercomputer in Switzerland, which for this red blood cell simulation is really a must, okay, because it's, it's extremely time consuming. And uh, it's also work that we did partially under the Combio Med European project. And of course, I want to thank my team. So sorry for the picture, it's a bit old. And so you will not see Remy and you will not see Frank, but uh, I guess you know their face. So uh, sorry for them, we have to take a new picture. So many faces, they, they are gone now. And we have, of course, as always, new faces. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm stopping here. Thank you, Belsien. I think this was a wonderful presentation, very clear. Um, any questions? If, if I may start the, the Levy flight that you showed, I really find this intriguing. Uh, could you explain a little bit more what exactly is causing this? Is this the red blood cell suddenly moving a platelet around for a long distance? Is this how we should see it? Uh, so we are, of course, exploring the cause. And uh, what we discovered, which uh, I, I could have brought this image also, is that if you look, if you take, uh, for instance, sorry, this type of simulation, but maybe this one you can see a bit. You see that actually sometimes you have holes. So yeah. the distribution of red blood cells is not uniform. Just accidentally you create some holes. And one hypothesis is that maybe a platelet by chance, it can travel more because it's just in this hole. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we, we plan to do some serious investigation to see whether the size and the frequency of this hole could explain what we observe. So it's still, uh, I mean, ongoing research, but, but I must say that some researcher doing similar simulation, sometimes they mention that, oh, it looks like my platelet, it, it got a big kick suddenly. Yeah. But they, they didn't say much about this and they didn't you know, put this in the perspective of a global process. So we are not the first one to observe that, but we are probably the first one to try to you know, put that as a new phenomena. And hopefully we can try an explanation, but you, you're right, that, that's not the next question. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, Bastian, can I ask a question? Yet? Sure. sure. A superb lecture, Bastian, and some amazing simulations and uh, animations. Uh, truly amazing. Uh, so, so two questions, if I may. Uh, first one, is, is this a lattice Boltzmann, a pure lattice Boltzmann simulation? Because I thought I could see interactions and, and deformation between the red blood cells. So are you, are you somehow modeling? Yeah, yeah. OK, so uh, then, then you're right. And, and maybe you see in the, in the title, that we actually, it's a combination of finite element method and, and lattice Boltzmann. So we decided to describe the, the um, surface of the red blood cells with a finite element uh, 
the soul girl. Okay. Um, so it's a combination of the two. And are you implementing contact mechanics between the red blood cells? No, actually, we, we have uh, interaction, uh, which is, uh, I mean, that's two parts. One is uh, purely hydrodynamic, is that fluid is in between and, and prevents uh, red blood cells to touch each other. But we also have an elastic uh, repulsion. So it's like really elastic body coming into contact, like a spring repulsion type, uh, which is easily implemented. But where you perfectly, uh, your question is, is perfectly right, is that actually nobody knows what this interaction is. It, it's, it's really part of something we would like also to study because maybe you know that, that uh, red blood cells, they are actually charged particles. They are negatively charged particles. And so they should repulse each other. And it's still a, a question to know what's the proper interaction you should put. And if you look at the other codes that are available uh, in, the, in the community to do simulation like that, you have, of course, um, um, Hemocell from Amsterdam, which is also ba based on Palabos for the fluid flow. But they have another strategy for describing the red blood cells. And they don't have other repulsion than just the fluid. So it's just uh, the fluid that, that keeps this red blood cell apart. And then you have other colleagues who actually have this so-called Morse potential, which is kind of an exponentially decreasing repulsion force, which is common in some physical chemistry problem, but, but no more validated. So it's also something we want to do with Karim is to actually ma make a red blood cell collider experimentally to see how they actually um, uh, interact. But that's, that's for the future. Super. And, and my, my second question is on your, uh, your Bayesian computations, uh, which I'm also very interested in. And did, did you find that, you know, when you, when you run through this, I think it's an approximate Bayesian computation method. Uh, did, did you, do you find that you're most, that you have a lot of configurations or, you know, states that can be very high likelihood, but those states are not so probable. So, I mean, or does uh, the statistical method? Yeah, I must say that it's mostly the work of uh, Rito, who, who does the, I would say, the dirty work. Yeah. <laughs> but I think he told me if, if I'm, I'm, that he needs to generate about 2,000, a few thousand um, set of parameters per uh, per computation so to do, to determine actually this these parameters it's about uh, I, I think 2000 3000 simulation but you can do that on a massively parallel system also so it, it has developed uh, a, a software called abc pi i can give you more information if you want that you can run in parallel on, on many uh, on big machine in case Excellent. Thanks again, Bastian. Fantastic talk. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, other questions? Hi, Bastian. Uh, this is Anu. Uh, just wanted to ask Bastian, uh, while you, in your, well, your presentation was very good, I have a question regarding the thrombolysis part. Just wanted to ask, um, when TPA is administered to the clot and there is flow, would the clot not also get compacted while uh, TPA uh, is being administered, uh, would that affect clot mechanical properties as well? Because it's an, uh, well, as uh, the clot is getting smaller, it's, uh, for example, if the clot is at bifurcation, this example is that me its mechanical properties is changing. So it's probably difficult to uh, lice uh, with TPA. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know, <laughs> frankly, I don't know. Uh, so far we just observed uh, the speed at which the front moves as mm -hmm. a function of, of different parameters. And um, we didn't consider <laughs> any structural change of the clock. Okay. So that, that's an interesting suggestion. And, and maybe I will, I will mention that to Karim to see if he can analyze maybe the, the potential transformation. Oh, thank you. And uh, were you analyzing this when you were doing this experiment? Was there pressure just on the top of the clot or 
Yeah, and it's just uh, actually the <laughs> amount of water that you get from the this to the top. Okay. Very nice. Great. Thank you, Bastian. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes, not. Uh, thanks a lot. I loved it a lot, the uh, presentation. And yeah, you got my mind wandering by uh, saying that uh, particles were uh, bouncing back from a permeable thrombus. That was an interesting thought. But while I was thinking about it, I think depending on the permeability of a medium, you have either flow like phenomenon or more like a diffusion like phenomenon. If it's really poorly permeable, I would say that there's a diffusion like uh, uh, phenomenon going on. Mm -hmm. Is it all taken care of by your simulations or is it something that you impose? So um, I, I can re respond in, a, in a, the following way. So uh, if you have all these obstacles, I mean, like you have here with different properties, and of course, you should also realize that in my picture, I put only the flow coming from the left, but I also flow on from all direction huh, in that case. So the, this, this bounce back that you see, this partial bounce back will create like diffusion, of course. So that's part of the disorder, which result in reorganizing uh, the fluid flow in a, like in a disorder media. So it's, I think it's, it's maybe what you call diffusion. Is it an answer you can <laughs> take or not? Yeah, yeah I guess that, that will, uh, yeah, that reflects the diffusion that, that way, uh, probably. So I, I don't think we need explicitly to add a diffusion, but I think that Remy at some point for the TPA particle, he, he could have had an additional diffusion that uh, purely the perturbation of the flow. But I'm, I'm not exactly sure if it's in the in the current version of the code or not. Yeah, that's right. I can add diffusion to the particles, but uh, not especially in the inside the clot. It's uh, everywhere. Okay. Thank you, Remy. Okay. Any other questions? If not. Uh, we should thank uh, Bastien. This was really a very good uh, lecture. I learned a lot, and I'm sure you all did. Thanks very much. And the, thank you, uh, you. Both you to be <laughs> present uh, <Yes>. this late. <laughs> okay. And uh, see you next time. See you all next time. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you, Maxian. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone.